Hello and welcome. My name is Bob Giraldi and I'm the chair of the live action short film graduate department at SVA in New York City. And this is the very first broadcast of The Future is Short, The Life and Death and Rebirth of the Short Film. Please meet writers Alex Dinalaris, playwright of Red Dog Howls, The Bodyguard Musical, and Still Life. And Alex is also the screenwriter of The Year of the Monarchs and the upcoming film Birdman. Along with Alex is the screenwriter and popular journalist of the New York Daily News, Dennis Hamill. Dennis is the author of 10 novels. The film rights to his novel, Fork in the Road, has been optioned by the Oscar-winning director, Alexander Payne. His screenplays include Turk 182, Critical Condition, and his latest independent film, Under New Management, on Netflix. Welcome. And it feels like today, the smaller everything is, the bigger it seems to become. I think that's true in the tradition of the newspaper business, where I learned my craft. First, brevity and economy has been the hallmark of the trade. I write a newspaper column, which has to be no more than 750 words three times a week. And you have to go out and cover pretty complex issues. Like last night, I covered the mayoralty election of Bill de Blasio. It was a great little New York moment where I walked down the street where I used to play stickball when I was a kid. And walking up the block was to build de Blasio with a bunch of Chinese takeout in his hands an hour before the polls closed. And I stopped him on the street, first time I ever met him, and I just started talking to him in Brooklynese, and we hit it off, and I got a real human portrait out of the guy, and it's in today's paper. And You have to write fast, you have to take copious notes, you have to have a good ear, and an eye for telling detail. Not all the details, because you don't have the room, but the telling detail which is the same in short stories or in short films. And you have to know how to tell that story and set it up and with pacing and payoffs. So a lot of times the kicker is in the lead. You build towards that. It's a craft. Part of it is a craft. That style worked for O. Henry, who wrote for newspapers, for Dickens, who wrote for newspapers, for Hemingway, who wrote for newspapers, for Zola, who wrote for newspapers. They learned the economy of words writing for newspapers. So I think... The natural transition is the, the short story after that, which feels like freedom. In my case, I've written novels, and, and those are like, you can, endless. That's pure joy. That's like having a vacation, which is what I did on my vacation. I uh, just finished it. But you took one of my brother Pete's short stories, Bob, that he published in the Daily News, which was a fictional piece, and turned it into a brilliant movie that's, I guess, 12 minutes long. And that started out as a short little riff in a newspaper that Pete did, a very O. Henry-esque kind of sketch about a kid, and um, it was called A Poet Long Ago. And I think that's a, the kind of trend. I think you'll find a market for that kind of stuff now, because people, like my kids, watch things on cell phones and on iPads, and their attention span is about as long as a, a mosquito's nose. So I think that if you can give them 12 minutes, they'll stick with it. you got to tell a good story. You've been listening to Dennis Hamill. Alex? I think that the attention spans are obviously shrinking exponentially year by year, and we can choose to pine for the halcyon days of patience and attention to storytelling, but I don't think that that's something that is going to make any huge comeback sometime soon. So to be able to tell a story, tell it well, craft it well in a shorter period of time and fit the bite-sized attention that's out there and still be able to make an impact, still be able to tell a story that resonates somehow, is going to be the future in one way or another. And so, in a way, there's two things. One, I just did a short play festival at 59, East 59, the theater, and it's becoming more and more popular every year. It's the seventh year now I've been involved three times, and it just becomes more popular. And what you have is three plays that are 25 minutes long, and the audience is happy as clams to be able to digest one, what's the next one. They leave happy there. There's no sense of being shortchanged by a short play. And there's no intermission that they have to look forward to no going back No intermission. There's 10 minutes in between and they get out and get their drinks and they enjoy the hell out of it. And you can still resonate with a really interesting story. Also, I've been turned on to by actor friends of mine into the world of the webisodes. A friend of mine, Darcy Siciliano, who's a wonderful actress, is in one called He's With Me, which is one of the top rated ones as far as I understand on the internet. And I watch it and they're 15 minute television shows. They're clever. They're quick. You get them bite-sized, so you can watch eight of them in a row if you want, which is the equivalent of watching a two-hour film, and they do, but it's sort of this manageable bite-sized piece. It's the future is to be able to be effective, and in those 15 minutes, in the old days, we used to just tell a quick story in that time, but now we're searching to make something with depth, something that actually resonates, and I think that's the challenge, and there's a market for it. 
and it's going to be a big part of the future of both film and television and the internet. Let's agree then that you as long form writers and journalists, column writers, have to find a way to come up with interesting concepts still, interesting writing, characterization, arcs, climaxes, shorter than ever before. Where do I tell my young students to begin. They're going to ask me, where do I get an idea from, Bob? How does it come into my head and then down through into my hands? You can't teach imagination. You can teach craft. You can teach discipline. You cannot teach passion or imagination. It's not possible. You can't do that for them. You can tell them how to use the best lens <laughs> and the best lighting and, and how to use music. But you can't teach people where, how to come up with ideas. Where does Stephen King come up with his ideas? I have absolutely no idea. I don't think he does. I think everybody who wants to be a writer should read his book. He wrote a wonderful book on the craft of on writing, writing called yeah. On Writing. It's great. Which he wrote after he got hit by a, a pickup truck. He almost died and he he didn't write for almost a year and he didn't think that he would, might ever write again. And so he went back to his roots and found to find out why he became a writer and started to explore his own life. So it's semi-autobiography, but it's also a book about craft and it's brilliant. It has great horse sense in it. And he gives you great lessons that you can use in any kind of writing, not, not just novel writing or short story writing. I love his short stories. I'm not a big horror fan, but his short stories are great. I mean, you know, that's Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, all those things that we've seen turned into terrific movies came from his short stories. But he's a guy that teaches you to use action verbs and concrete nouns and get rid of adverbs and adjectives and all that. That's the kind of stuff you have to learn about screenwriting really fast. You cannot film a metaphor. You cannot film an adjective. You, you film verbs. One of my suggestions to people, even if they're not sports writers, is listen to sports casters. They speak in cinematic terms. He roped that the second. He charged through the line. Right. It's an action verb. He doesn't say he ran really fast through it, which is a too many words. He charged through the line. You know, he uh, slammed into that, you know. So if you listen to those people, they have a great sense of action verbs, which is really what propels cinematic writing. Really good writing has got to be economical. The fewer words on the page, the better, especially in Hollywood where they hate to read. They don't like to read. There's this whole thing in this book about screenwriting here, which I think is a pretty good one. It's called What Happens Next? about verticality. They want to be able to read a page that, not from left to right, but from top to bottom. They want to see as few words on it as possible. Yeah. You know, hence they, final drafts. Yes. If you want to learn the craft of writing screenplays, that's easy to do. Uh, imagination can't help you with. I think in the day and age when you scroll through your Facebook page and you see a, a video of some political action. I just saw one yesterday about a news crew that did a thing on, on Muslims and they pretended to be racist and, then, and how the people in this delicatessen would respond. But anyway, you get a million of those on Facebook a day and some of them hit you in the gut, whether it's sad, whether it's funny, some of them hit you in the gut. As a writer, my whole thing is going sort of backwards. If we're trying to get to that, that sort of Aristotelian value of surprising and inevitability, that you could take the moment that hits you in the gut. I saw a great film by a journalist named Inigo Gilmore from Channel 4 News London, and it was about South African police, and it's horrifying to watch. It's half hour, and it's almost unbearable. But there's one moment where this third grade teacher is standing in a protest, and the cops come, and they're, it's all corrupt and horrible, but they shoot him in the chest with rubber bullets. And you watch that moment, and it'll haunt me sort of for the rest of my life, because he knows he's dead. Like they shot rubber bullet at him, but you're looking at a man who knows he's about to die, but it's going, it's happening slowly. And he's still trying to get out his point as he's dying. And to me, that always haunts me. That idea of somebody that is dead, but, and knows he's dead, but is not dead yet. And if that hit me in the gut, I might say, well, what's that? What's that that's bothering me? And how do I write a piece where that's the surprisingly inevitable end of it? Right. And then I can start by building exposition that will get me there. I could do benign things. I could take that one story of that third grade teacher and start us in a classroom where he's looking out a window and I could start it anywhere, but I'm gonna get to a moment where a man knows he's dead. I think that that could happen with a funny piece. I think it could happen with an old woman and a cat. I think it could happen on YouTube. I could think it could happen to your family at a dinner table. It starts I mean, with trusting yourself though. It starts with trusting yourself. If you, you it's have what to, right, if what you're a writer you. and, and, and you see something and you react to it emotionally, you have to, and it touches you in some kind of universal way. You think that other people will be touched the same way. Go for it. Don't waste right. time. And that, by the way, that's the definition of, in the bigger scale, that's the definition of viral. Yeah. Right? It means when you saw it, you felt that, and a million other that's people right. felt exactly the same way. So trust what you feel. That's trust right. yourself. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. 
Speaking of exposition and speaking of rules of screenwriting, I've never learned them. I'm a director, obviously, and don't pay much attention to the rules, but it seems that the craft of screenwriting has comes along with storytelling do's and don'ts. Do you guys think that that really works as well or at all in yeah, short screenwriting? Yeah, sitting around a fire bullshitting. I mean, that's really what telling a story is, but there's a craft to do it. That's one craft. Novel writing is another craft. Journalism is, is another craft, but, but it's all storytelling. It's all writing. You have to entertain, which is, again, going back to Aristotle. If you don't entertain, you lose the reader. It's just as simple as that. So you have to capture them. If you have a bigger message, that's fine, but entertain them first. With screenwriting, pay attention. Read some of the books by William Goldman. I mean, there's two really, really good ones called Adventures in the Screen Trade. Another one called Which, which Lie Did I Tell? I tell. And they're great. I mean, he has a whole chapter on the way to write is to know Start the story as late as humanly possible and get out of it as early as, as possible. End it as early as possible. The same with every single scene. Enter the scene as late as you can. Get out of the scene as soon as you can. Brilliant. And that will give you pacing. That'll make it cinematic. It'll make it move. They're called movies because they move. And, you know, they don't stand still. That you know, You're not painting portraits. You are not doing still lives. You're doing a motion picture. So it's got to move. Uh, he has some great horse sense in those ones. There's a great book called Backstory, which is interviews with all the, all the old screenwriters, I.A.L. Diamond and Ben Hecht and all those guys who were the pioneers of this right. craft. This is 100 years old, this craft. I mean, there were no motion pictures before. And so people that wrote, have been writing movies for only a century, which is nothing. You know, considering that we're still reading Shakespeare and Aristotle, you know. But these guys had to figure out how to make movies work. And they have simple things in it. Never let a guy leave through the same door that he comes in, in a scene. That's something in my head for the rest of time. I will never write a scene <laughs> right, where a guy exactly. walks in, says something, and then yeah, walks out. Yeah, you know. yeah, I'll throw in one more. There's a book called, uh, I wish I remembered the author's name. I'm ashamed that I don't. But it's called Aristotle in Hollywood. Yeah. And it's a really, really... I did a column well, about it. You did? <laughs> yes. A really interesting yeah. book, the way he, he just yeah. goes through Aristotle and applies it to Hollywood, and I think that's fascinating. But back to your other question, just to go around the back end again, look, there are rules to storytelling, and it's about conflict, it's about reversals, it's about action, it's about constantly surprising Super. so that you entertain your audience. And I think that these rules are there, and you find in the young student the instant yearning to rebel, and that's fine. You can do that. And I'll be teaching a playwriting seminar and somebody will say, well, you know, I know there are rules in three act structure and Aristotle and all that. But what about, you know, waiting for Godot? What about Beckett? And I'm like, Beckett knew the rules inside and out. He just blew them up. So if you look at waiting for Godot and you look at Sid Field's structure for screenplay, it's there. It's just everywhere where something is supposed to happen to move the story forward is when the little boy comes in and says, Godot can't make it today, but surely he'll be here tomorrow to see right. you. So he's literally understanding the structure and where some Something should happen in what we know about Aristotelian structure. He reverses it and makes it a vacuum and says nothing is going to happen it right still now. Works. And we move, and it still works. John Luc Godard said to me, "Yes, I believe there should be a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not always in that order." He said, <laughs> <laughs> "But because I mean, you can be adventurous. Don't try that in your first." I think there are rules to be had, and I think you you ignore them at your peril. You yes. can blow them up. You can invert them. You could be brand new. I'm working with Alejandro Gonzalez and Yarty right now. Babel. 21 Grams, Amores Perros. These are three movies that blow up yes. their, their own structure right. and work somehow. So you can do that, yeah. but just know what it is first before you decide to be. Is the short story dependent on an ending that is about a twist or a change of direction or a surprise? Something that I find myself when I'm criticizing young people's scripts that I would say, well, this might work better if it didn't end green but ended blue. The thing is that it can't be inauthentic because often you'll come up with somebody who saw the usual suspects too many times. And a surprise is great, a twist is great. If you can organically fit it into the structure, That's yes. It. Otherwise, it could be just about the punch of the quietness of the thing. If you do a short film about Alzheimer's, it could be the punch of the film could be in the silence in the very middle and not necessarily about do they recover or do they not. That sort of form is the mystery form, which is age old and tried and true. And if you watch every television show that's a procedural on TV, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary. I think if you have one that's organic, you're in the bonus. 
I think too many people now are trying to manufacture that. And so it's inorganic and we don't feel the satisfactory good. It becomes I think, again, contrived. It right. becomes contrived. I feel that now. And I think that that's maybe time to maybe get away from, I might run this class of young people trying to make a thesis film and tell them no surprise endings. Let's be authentic. Let's or, just... Or unless it's, like you said, unless it's organic. Organic and flows. Because, you know, know, real life has surprises and have twists at the end of it. Sometimes people live at the end and they don't die, you know. So a frivolous question, and that's about the opportunity to be on the set of something that you've written. Do you guys look forward to that? Do you do it much? Or do you experience what I consider to be a sort of rough treatment that Hollywood in particular gives writers after they option and take their material? Well, I'll say this. I just had this experience. We just got done filming Birdman, which is directed by Alejandro Gonzalez and Yari too. And we filmed all here in New York at the St. James Theater and around the theater district and at the Kaufman Studios in Astoria. I'll do one quick story which was, it's a brilliant cast of that film. It's Michael Keaton, Edward Norton, Naomi Watts, Zach Galifianakis, Emma Stone, Amy Ryan, Andrea Riseborough. Unbelievable cast. And we were at Kaufman and we were doing a scene and it's all in long tracking shots, the whole thing. So if you blow any part of it, like seven minute tracking shots, if you blow any part of it, you got to start at the beginning. So everybody's petrified the whole time. And Zach is going through it. I've written the script and these jokes and Zach and Michael have a long walk and talk that ends up in Michael's dressing room and see how I can edit the story as I tell it. But they do the whole thing. And at the end, Alejandro laughs, says print. The crew is unbelievably relieved because it was a long tracking shot. Zach comes running out behind and says, I missed something. He knew a piece of humor that he could put in was missing and it was simply leaning on the doorway, but Zach is a brilliant comedic mind. So if he knows it, so we had to do the shot again. We go into Alejandro, we're gonna do it one more time. Loaded it up again, just so Zach could get through it. And when he got through the end, you watched him do this one gesture. And I said, of course you do. Of course you have to do that. And it was the difference. And so from, to me, it was thrilling. But in that case, I want to say for the record that Alejandro is a guy that doesn't dismiss you on the sets, that he works with you and wants you and needs you. And you're constantly there with your notebook. The experience when it's not that is pretty miserable. I was on the set of uh, one of the Hollywood movies I wrote. That was uh, Terry 182. And I didn't stay for long. You know what it was? It was boring and for me, for the most part. The second one, Critical Condition, we wrote as a, as a murder mystery about a blackout in the hospital, and, but they cast Richard Pryor. So, so they said, this has to be, a, Paramount Pictures said, this has to be a comedy now. I said, there's nothing funny about a hospital during a blackout, people die. They said, well, it's Richard Pryor, we have to make it work, so... They did, but they... Uh, <laughs> so that's what, I, happens. I that's what happens phone. to those sacred words. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and I was in it, and it was very funny. They cast me, and Michael Apted cast my brother in, in a scene in it, and we couldn't remember any of our own dialogue. <laughs> 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 Richard Pryor was goofing all over us. But, uh, so that was as, as much as we did with it. But So it, it depends. It depends. Depends on yeah. your welcome. Yeah, yeah I got right. to rewrite the stuff I had to rewrite on the set. Why would either of you write a short film? You could say a lot in a short film. I think writing a short film, you have a better chance of getting it made. made because of practicality. Real. Yeah, it's it. practical. And if you have something to say, like that short story of Pete's that you took, when people were done watching it, they wanted more and more. They wanted to see a feature length about those characters because they got a real keyhole into the lives of those people. They were affected by it. And sometimes the, the best writing, best screenwriting are the things that you leave out, not what's in there. You know, you can write a 170-page script and pare it down to 110 pages, but those the 60 pages that you took out inform the rest of what's already there because you've thought it out that way. Doing a short film, it's cheaper. It reaches a bigger audience. You want to reach an audience, and uh, young people are looking at these short films and, and this new technology. Sometimes short form is about moments. It's about an immediate emotion. It doesn't require exposition or development. It's just about this punch. And sometimes it's better to get that out in a short story, that particular emotion, that particular thing that you want to yell about or laugh about. Sometimes it fits in that form rather than development, where if you're trying to figure something out sort of in the long form, like the movie Beautiful that I worked on, it, that requires an hour and a half of character development and exposition. Sometimes short form is like, I just want to say this one thing, it's bugging me, and this is the best form to do it. Because if I stretch it out, it would be diluted. It also can help filmmakers take the next step. When I was in college, I went to CUNY. I had a filmmaking teacher, his name was John Hancock. And he had won an Oscar for a short called Sticky My Fingers, Fleet My Feet, which was about guys that played touch football in Central Park. 
It was a simple little film about guys that do that every Sunday and the drama of it and how they kept their, they, they stayed as kids all those years longer by playing football. On the basis of that, he got his first feature, which was called Bang the Drum Slowly, which was one of Robert De Niro's first films with Michael right. Moriarty. It was just a simple progression. The people loved, he won the Oscar for that. People liked it. They said he could do that baseball movie because he did the football one, which wasn't, it wasn't about football. It was about kid, people who didn't want to grow up, like Peter Pan. And then he got this other movie. It's a good place to learn your craft, I think, in that short form. And I think we're ignoring one simple fact is that maybe this is generational uh, in this room. But that's that the internet and the short form on the internet, as far as film goes, is the future, whether we like it or don't like it. I grew up in, with the movies in the 70s, and that's done. That's done. That's why writers are in television as well, because you can't write right. And Justice for All and have it produced right. anymore. Right. You know, oh, not even Barry Levinson could do it. Not even Barry Levinson could do it, right. I would like to thank both of you, Dennis Hamill and Alex Dinolaris, both marvelous men, marvelous writers, great talents. Thank you for listening, and please join us next time when we continue on the journey to find the newest and most talented short filmmakers.